Okay. So, if you recall, we were <coughs> discussing the plume rise, okay, and I gave you an expression for the plume rise, and we said it has two terms or two components. One was more related to momentum rise, and the other one more because of the thermal buoyancy. There are many more formulas for the plume rise and much more accurate than one which I gave you, but for the time being we think this is all right. I mean, if you really look into the literature you find many people have developed more rigorous formulas and even they have validated the plume rise formula for the various conditions. You see here why plume rise is so important, if you see the expression of your Gaussian model where does the plume rise appear in the formula? It is in the exponential term and so therefore, anything which is in the exponential term is very sensitive. The little change the overall impact that you will see in the concentration could be very high. So, people have essentially solved the momentum equation, the heat equations to get some formulas for the plume rise, but at for this course okay, we will be happy with the formula that we wrote yesterday. Okay. And if you want more uh, information on that, you can look for the Senfield book, okay, that the one of the references that we gave. He deals the subject really in great detail, but for our uh, this course, the formula which we had or which we described yesterday or in the last class is valid and we will use that. Okay. So, if I can write that formula again, okay, let us write it again. delta h okay <coughs> we also define the units for them because once we write some constants then we have to define the units. <coughs> and I will again want to remind you that what were the units as far as the pressure was concerned? Millibar, always remember that that is for the millibar. Okay. And the other thing which I ask you again and again, this u is at what height? You can see back or at, at the stack tip. Okay. Do not forget that, because this is what is the wind which is influencing my delta h. How much will be rise will be def defined by the or decided by the horizontal wind at the tip of the stack. Okay. This formula for the plume rise is generally valid for neutral conditions. Okay. So, valid for for unstable delta h times 1.2 for stable zero point eight to zero point nine whatever you take. So, that is the other thing you should know. Okay, I want, well, we will do something, but before we do that, I want you to recognize that, well, if I want to increase the delta H, because that is where the I can minimize the impact, what are the things which are in my control? This I cannot do anything about this one. I can increase perhaps the T stack, ambient temperature, I have no control. Okay. The diameter of the stack I can increase perhaps. Okay. The velocity of the exit gases that I can manipulate, put a larger blower to blow the things at the larger speed. Okay. This again I have no control onto the horizontal wind, okay. but what you see I have no control, but this and this variation may not be so significant, but we all know the u is the one which is highly variable. 
okay. Sometimes wind speed can be very large, sometimes wind speed can be low and things like that. So, the trick here or the thing is my delta h for given conditions this might I can manipulate, but this I cannot manipulate okay. and then you see the delta h can or rather delta h will be inversely proportional to the wind speed. So, more is the wind speed it means plume will not be able to rise too much it will be forced down somehow okay. So, <coughs> so there is one situation okay that we call as a down wash or rather aerodynamic down wash of the pollutants okay. So, that we will try to define that one or we will quickly do it here because it is a very simple thing. to the plume. What happens is when you have a chimney or stack okay, and this all you have noticed yourself when wind is very high okay, the plume instead of rising you will see sometimes the plume just going like this. And that you must have seen from the brick kilns, for example, as you are traveling on the road, you see the brick kiln and the wind is high, then just the plume just comes on the ground, okay. Or you might have seen, suppose you have gone to the hilly areas, you know, the people do the heating in their houses, and you see the plume is coming out from little chimney and it just comes underneath the house, okay. So, that is what typically we call as the downwash or other aerodynamic downwash of the plume. When it happens, when the situation is u is greater than is greater than 1.5 v s. This horizontal wind is too high compared to the exit velocity of the exit this is what which is going this is u and this velocity inside the chimney is your V s. Okay. See one thing will be covered by the stability okay, in that area whatever the stability and in the coastal area suppose the wind is high. Okay. Now, what, what we should do is that we should modify this one and then this is what we take as the, the ratio of V s by u just a second this we should correct V s by u okay, is less than because we have to take this ratio right. Okay. Now, let us answer your question. So, you are saying in the, in the coastal area what could happen to the plume rise. Okay. See this is still the plume rise will still be valid only thing is that if suppose in the coastal area wind is high that will be taken care by the wind and the suppose the stability is different okay. that will be taken care by the these factors. Okay. There are some more thing which requires very special operation into the coastal area that we will see if we, will, if we have the chance to cover that thing or if we do not have the chance to cover that thing in time. Similarly, not only the coastal area suppose you have a large water body near your chimney large water body means or within the distance of 15 kilometers a large water body is there and then it can influence your plume to a large extent okay. and that dispersion modeling is little different okay. that we have not talked about that but maybe we will talk for that we have the time. Okay. Essentially what happens is that you see at the interface of the sea and the, the land or the water at the land see the mixing height okay, as we have seen the mixing height is very different on to the surface of the sea or of the water and at the land it is entirely different. Okay. So, that mixing height has the influence on to the land. Okay. So, when the wind is coming from the land uh, the sea side, so it has a mixing height is governed more by because of the mixing height at the water level okay, and that has some changes. So, generally these things what we are saying is you can say is generally valid for the source which is almost about 10 to 15 kilometers away from a water body. Okay. But as an approximate as a, as a, as a tool to take some decision. Okay this formula is still quite valid. 
So, the coastal thing which may affect you this thing that will affect early in the early hours you may get little different results, but once the whole the day has come up then things more or less this becomes valid, but that you are right the certainly the coastal area uh, modeling is a little different at least in some early hours of the day after that things become the same what you are saying, but as I again say for um, routine purposes even the coastal area you can this take this and take the broad decisions. Sometimes as engineer you have to take the broad decisions okay. not very minute decision whether the industry should come at the distance of 5.62 meters from the coastal area you have to say well it should come somewhere from 10 to 20 meters. In. Yes, so then then you can just look into the any of the books you can say the water air quality modeling in the coastal areas okay. or water quality modeling at the lake shore. Okay. So, air quality modeling at the lake shore and that can you see the difference that will be shown. Maybe if we have the time we will discuss that okay. and uh, if not we will skip at least as far as this course is concerned this slightly at the higher level and the person who did lot of work onto this coastal air quality modeling or is it is called lake shore modeling basically because it is whether it is a coastal area or a large water body is there it is the same thing. There was one person called Dr. Mishra from Ministry of Environment Ontario Canada. He was the very uh, person who did a lot of work onto this one and his work is the one which is always referred to when it comes to the air quality modeling in the coastal area or near a large water body. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I want to define in the same connection. for this condition this is the correction and d stands for downwash this is the correction you apply to your plume rise okay if you are under the situation when your exit velocity the ratio of exit velocity to horizontal wind speed at the tip of the stack is less than 1.5. It should be 1 by correction become negative. See here suppose your V s by u okay, is less than 1.5 let us do the example since you have asked suppose, suppose I take diameter as the 3 meters fine. Okay. And the ratio of the exit velocity by u is less than 1.5. Let us say it is 1, okay. 1 minus 1.5, okay. That brings 6, that is equal to 3. Is that right? Right. So, the plume rise which you calculated here was whatever that rise was or minus, or if this correction is that this or the final delta h. after downwash equals to delta h that you have calculated above plus h d that does it make sense now. So, your effective plume rise will reduce because it has been subjected to aerodynamic downwash. So, that is why you see that factor coming out to be negative all right clear ok. This is the thing and just remember you do not apply this formula or uh, this correction if your horizontal wind speed the ratio of your exit velocity to horizontal wind speed is more than 1.5. It means that horizontal plume will not have effect in bringing down the pollutants down ok and this sometimes can be very important because see you may have designed a lot of things you might have designed a good temperature, you might have designed a good diameter, but if your exit velocity is not properly designed you will unnecessarily cause serious problem to the people living in the area ok. And this since the discussions are going on this sometimes one time we encountered this 
for a sulfuric acid plant. Okay. Sulfuric acid plant the typically the way the chemical engineers design sulfuric acid plant they design some exit velocity of let us say between 3 to 4 meters per second. Okay. So, if the V s is let us say 3 okay, let us say well we are drifting but well, let us drift from what we normally want to do for sulfuric acid plant the what we have measured the exit velocity is anywhere from 3 to 4 meters per second. Okay. So, if on some day okay, horizontal wind speed is very high okay, let us say it is 7 okay, okay, then what happens or let us say this is we are taking a hypothetical example let us say this is uh, your um, what number you want me to take. Suppose the horizontal wind speed also was 3 meters per second. Okay, or maybe even more. You can encounter the four meters per second. Okay, so this comes out to be nearly something like zero point seven. Okay, much less than one point five. And you will see the sulfuric acid plant, which is responsible for SO two emission and acid mist. If you recall, that thing will be brought down, and the people surrounding in that area will suffer a lot. Okay. Because the plant was designed for such low, plant was designed as to as a 4, 3, 4 meter exit velocity or a stack exit velocity. Okay. So, these things are somehow you see a chemical engineer may not know all these things, but all becomes interdisciplinary when you are checking or you are doing some calculation for sulfuric acid plant, you ask him what is your exit velocity. And to give you a little feel that exit velocity in the power plant for example, if you go and measure in the chimney in Punky power station this might be anywhere from 15 to 25 meters per second. So, that you see the plume from the large power plant is not affected because of the section and whereas, in the brick kilns because I gave you the example of the brick kiln because brick kiln is most of the time what it is, it is a natural raft there is no fan put inside this one. Okay. If there is no fan put inside obviously, the V s will be always be determined by the temperature difference and things like that. So, these smaller stacks will be forced okay, or will face the aerodynamic downwash because of the V s is generally very low. Okay. So, you see in the village area you go there and the brick kiln is there and then although I am the temperature of the brick kiln may be something like 250 degrees, okay. but you see the plume is just washed down and surrounded in that area and people suffer a lot. Okay, that is what the situation. So, sir, the plume rise that depends upon the type of the source uh, from where the emission. Suppose we are taking thermal from power plant, sir. Particulate matter is high, so there will be densities to be high, sir. And suppose we are taking uh, such a uh, ready mix plants of bituminous, their uh, emissions will be different. Oil refining this, there will be different, sir. So, does that affect these plume rise? Okay. How are they taking? All right. This formula again I repeat this is simple formula. Okay. This is based on to the density of the hot air that is going out, but these subtle things okay, or the change in the density because of particles or change in the density because largely it may not be the air. Okay. Those things are taken care by the other complicated formulas that we are not discussing in the class and those formulas the, the person who has done most of the work in the plume rise is gentleman called bricks. Okay. Bricks B R I G G S bricks and he is a person like uh, must be around 85 years old if he is still surviving I do not know. And now he is he says that he gets some like 20 30 emails every day even today asking something about the plume rise and then although he tries to answer, but he says most of the time well I am retired now please ask to some other people who are more actively involved in this. So, Briggs is a person who has done this work and then he has accounted for all the density part, what kind of plume it is, what kind of um, uh, the emissions that are there either from the refinery or from the power plant or from the from the particles, the large particles, the small particles and things like that. So, again in summary we want to stick to what we have for the time being, okay. but the Briggs you just write on the internet as Briggs plume rise and then you will find the pages after pages on that one or you say Senfield book 
look at the bricks and then it will give you. So, this point is clear and small thing, but very important thing, because this will cause a very serious problem to the people and the concentrations here can be very, very large in spite of all efforts that you might have made. So, that is why the aerodynamic downwash of the pollutant is so important to know about that. See, we have talked about a lot that about the U. In many lectures, I have told again and again take u at this step or take u at this, u is this, u is this, all right, or you maybe your u is suppose your plant is let us say at the tip of a hill, then maybe the you have to take the u at much higher height and things like that. So, I have not defined you so far as to how you can find out the u at different heights, okay. It is very simple, the, the, the formulation is like this. And this, where where this has come from? Vertical profile of the of the wind. We all know about that. We study in pipes and open open channel flow and things like that, right? So that's why this is what is your z, and these are your. This also this parameter n depends on two things, okay? Stability, okay? Because that stability we can disturb your wind profile, right? And also the conditions whether these are there in urban conditions or these are in rural conditions, okay? So wind profile, okay? If you go to Connaught Place area of Delhi, it will become very different. The building, the roughness, and things like that and you go to the area which is like gangetic plain, flat terrain, things will be different. Okay. This profile, suppose there are large buildings here, this could be affected. So, this n will be different for urban areas and n will be different for the rural areas which is like kind of flat terrain. So, it also depends on surface roughness, how this is, how it depends that we will probably not see, but what I will do is I try to give you the, uh, the value of n. Okay. So, the n, suppose you have a stability a, b, c, d, e, f, right. So, I have, I have given you it a methodology or technique, if you know a wind speed at particular height, okay, you can translate that wind speed depending on the stability that you are talking about and the area being urban or rural area, you can find out the new wind speed that is what you require in your calculations. Okay. I am not giving you for the rural area I mean, you know, like, and by the way you do not have to remember these things, no one can really remember. Okay. So, but you should have the idea that this it works this how and then you can always refer where the n is, but what you, you should really know is that where this has come from. Okay. The physics part you should know, okay. not the numbers, no one can remember the numbers, but the physics is that what we should not only know, we should understand it. We want to slightly do something more. A new thing, slightly new thing, area source. Okay. Partly we had talked about the area source, if you recall, using the mass balance approach. And we did an example about what was the example in the city of Kanpur, the sulfur dioxide levels, etcetera, etcetera, and then whatever we came up with, the concentration should be so much. 
but there we did not utilize the property of turbulence. We simply assumed that everything was thoroughly mixed from the ground level to the top of mixing height. right? Okay. But then since we have developed some more theory, so we should improve our concept of the area source model and account for the turbulence and things like that. Okay. How this is done? Um, I will show you, but before that uh, what we do is, uh, okay. what is the importance of considering the area source? See, I mean uh, the, the formula that we developed was generally for the chimney or the stack, that is what we call as the point source, because one single chimney is there, that is your point source. Okay. But for area source, it is almost impossible to go to every house okay, and see what the chimney you have or go to every little tiny industry and say what chimney you have. So, in order to facilitate a modeling, we we'll take that as the area source okay. and then you see what is happening in that particular area. Suppose you go in the Bada Chora, I cannot count for every vehicle, okay. so I will take that as the area source and try to model that as the area source. So, that is what is the significance of the area source to simplify the things. Otherwise, I have to do the calculation suppose, suppose there are 3 lakhs of vehicles are there, then I have to model 3 lakhs of vehicles, that is almost impossible for me. So, this is how the concept of the area source comes in, that was the little significance that I wanted to talk to you. But let us consider the area source. Okay. Let us say this is a square. Okay. Uh, So, the emission is occurring from this area, I mean the plume is not from the chimney, but it is going like this okay. from and this is the plan by the way. Okay. So, now what how we model this one is very simple, okay. we we'll try to define some point source, because we can model the point source. right? So, we try to find out a virtual point source okay. and how this is done is okay. I try to locate this source somewhere back, but as a little chimney. Okay. So, let us say if I, I put the equivalent of this one at some this thing and treat this as the point source okay. and this is what we call this as virtual source right. Okay. So, just imagine suppose I had a chimney here and it had traveled up to here, what would be difference from having this traveled from here to here, the q is the same mass is the same, but it has got spreaded, right? that is the only difference that has come. So, what we do is that we say well all right, this was a virtual source somewhere, but right now what picture we are seeing is the source with initial spread. Okay. And if okay, okay. This is what is a wind direction that I am assuming, okay. this is my wind direction. Okay. You can take the other way also the wind direction and then you say this is the wind is blowing like this. So, if you have the wind like this you can take that as the virtual source as the wind and but then is it real approximation then you are saying the chimney is located here. Okay. And when at the tip of the chimney, your sigma y and sigma z are nearly 0, right. Sigma y and sigma z, the spread in the plume is nearly 0. Is that correct here? This is not correct. Sigma y and sigma z in the source is already there is some sigma y and sigma z. Okay. So, there is a spread already. It means it amounts or tent amounts to having, having say that there is some source which was a point source by the process of the wind transportation, it has already spread it to something. Okay. So, how this can be? 
how accurate is this one all right. <coughs> See what you do is that when you make some assumptions one of the things is the you do the measurements on the field. The people have done the measurements and they found well this is all right and then uh, more by the by the experience and empirical thing and empiricism in the modeling that we always employ. So, it is based on that one. So, it is reasonably accurate because sometimes we just want to as an engineer you want to make an estimate not that accuracy of the thing okay. that. So, that we want to make an estimate of that one so, and the modeling is nothing but the estimates okay. these are not the measurements measurements are always much accurate okay. estimates are the one which the model provides. So, this has been reasonably estimate and that is how it is modeled okay. you can do that it just requires how much efforts you want to put in right. If I want if I have limited time and then then I would rather do this one and even if I make this as a grid and suppose the improvement in my predictions is not so large compared to what is the resolution I want okay. For large source area low large cities like Kanpur and Agra and things like that or Delhi you can't really do so much of tiny calculation of course, you have the powerful computer you can do it people do it you can also do it, but this is the simple way where you can do the things quickly. Yes. It can certainly be done because and it the, the results that uh, it also conserves mass as well as the energy budget sir. Correct. So, sir it can be a good estimate sir. It, ca it empirical we can estimate. That is correct. See the thing is what is your requirement how accurate you want to be and in order to be the accurate you may have a fantastic mathematics ok. You may have a fantastic grid, but if your input variables are not very accurate ok your wind speed is not accurate what you are doing you are doing the measurements here, but wind speed is major let us say even if I take the example of Kanpur you are trying to do something let us say in Shardanagar and your wind data has come from the Chakiri airport ok. So, you might have fantastic thing here, but the wind is not such a good thing. So, you might still not get the reasonable results right. So, in order to get an estimate ok you want to apply such a thing where you can quickly see as to what is happening ok, but you can certainly do you can divide it a grid of point or 500 meters or half kilometers you can not only divide the grid in a horizontal you can also have the grid which is function of x y and z you can solve the equation in every little grid ok and find out the concentration. You can even you can also not only mo model the concentration you can model the wind vector also ok. Suppose you go there and you strike to a building the physical factor has gone into your model ok or GIS base then it is the wind say ok wind has cannot go this way then it turns this way, but that accuracy it all boils down to how much accurate you want things to be ok. If you have to take a quick decision ok, if you want to take a broad decisions is that all right ok. That is why in the broader sense we do it, but if you want to do the things more accurate more efforts are required more energy is required and if the situation so warrants we should do that. And then we what we apply the numerical modeling and things like that. Maybe time permitting, we will have one lecture, one or two lectures on the numerical modeling of air pollutants, ok. That we will see, and there we will make the grids and things like that. And the other thing you want to make the grid, especially when you want to find a you want to have a good time resolution, ok. I am interested in not what is happening minute to minute, I am interested what is 24 hour average. When you take the assembled or assembly of the things your little things which you might get with your finer modeling and finer grids they will be kind of somehow suppressed in there and that is what is maybe your objective. If your objective is to say one hour uh, change in the concentration of carbon monoxide then you better do it this way, but I want to find out the 24 hour average sulfur dioxide concentration I will be happy with doing this one. And in fact, when you take the larger average many things cancel out ok and then you might be just be happy. So, it all depends what is your requirement, what is the situation and what you really need this one for ok. So, we can think that is a virtual source ok, which is starting from here and dispersing like this right. I can think of a point source 
at the upwind and my do not forget this is my wind direction. Okay. This is my wind direction is like this. So, what with experience and with many other uh, uh, studies we found out suppose this distance is S. Okay. Sigma y 0 okay. sigma y 0 that you are observing here is approximately s by 4. I will confirm this uh, s by 4 of this business in a moment. Well, exact number is 4.2. All right. So, whatever is your area of your source, okay, and one of the sides of this one is S. Okay, so you get the sigma y zero. Okay, for this corresponding sigma y zero. this distance is what I can call this as x 0 and call this as the virtual distance. Okay. Now, S is known to me that area that I have defined somebody has to tell me how I can find out x 0. Sigma y 0 is that the horizontal dispersion coefficient that we talked about, but that since I am talking at the initial this thing I am taking initial spread is so much. Okay. Please tell me how can I find out x naught. We have a graph that we talked about that was a Turner that he developed in Tennessee Valley Authority and what he gave us the relationship between x and sigma y is right. If you recall what kind of graphs we had normally what have we have been doing so far we know the x and we find out the sigma y right. Okay. Here you know the sigma y 0 and take the stability let us say my stability was c find out the distance and this will be my virtual distance for obvious reasons right this will be my x naught. Okay. So, you can find out the x naught. No problem there. If you find the x naught, okay, then it means you have physically relocated the source from here to here. Okay. Then whatever is your distance which is there, which you are of course measuring from here, okay, the, the distance that you will consider, suppose I want to predict the concentration at the r. So, the distance for the r okay, that actually is let us say x r, but for all my model calculation I will take the distance equals to x naught plus x r clear. For all my calculating sigma y and sigma z further down further down from x naught. So, the distance that I will use in my rest of the formulation will be the distance or the or the downwind distance that I will take for my this thing will be virtual distance plus actual distance. Okay. 
is what we talked as a concept ok. Uh, <coughs> we will do some examples do not worry about that, but you understand what I have done ok. And then you can also find the sigma z similarly. I want to talk a new thing and we will finish it keep some patience eh, if we go overboard with time. line source ok. Many times we encounter a situation when the vehicles are going on highway and things like that ok. This is your highway or GT road or whatever you would like to call and then you have the kind of infinitely long ok and you have the vehicles on there and vehicles are travelling ok. And let us say I will assume that wind ok is like this, but we will change it at some point ok for, for simplicity let us take this as the wind is blowing like this ok. So, now somebody please tell me what is my x direction and y direction because I want you to be clear as to what is my x direction and what is my y direction. This is my x direction ok always the wind direction is my x direction ok. So, as the wind change my x direction changes obviously ok all right then this is my y direction. Now, if you recall uh, whatever your the, the formula which we have de developed for the point source, we will try to modify that based on the situation we have. So, if you recall the C This what is this concentration? At what is it some height or at the ground level? This is at the ground level because my z equals to 0 ok. So, let us say so x y 0 coming from a height of h ok. When you have the infinitely long source ok you want to define your emission rate q in terms of mass per unit time per unit length ok. Because there you had the one point source you could say oh, ok. Then you want to say here <coughs> what is your emission from all these things in terms of the mass per unit time per meter ok. So, normally you want to define in this situation which is more uh, acceptable to me is that I will define this q which I am writing as a small q with respect to the line source that is in terms of mass time length if you like or let us say microgram per second per meter ok. So, if I am saying that ok then the best thing for me is to rewrite this equation as ok. I suppose I take a small strip here ok in my in my y direction ok. ok. So, I can say that This amounts to the same as the large cube 
ok dimension wise ok I am just considering this small strip. So, under this situation we are doing nothing great, under this situation I want to find out the concentration, the way I defined q okay, in terms of d q and the, the small distance in the y direction as d y. Okay. So, if I want to find out the concentration I can integrate the both the sides, okay. so c will become, let us take the constants out, okay. q is constant phi sigma y and sigma z do not depend on y, they depend on x good. So, I can take that out u is also not function of y, okay. what about h and sigma z square they also not function of y. Then rest of the thing, this is function of y obviously, is anything else with respect to y, nothing else. Okay. So, then I can integrate this from y, which y can expand from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? Okay. minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. So, you we have exponential minus y square 2 sigma y square times d y right. Okay. If I make substitution, okay. suppose if I say s equals to suppose I make a substitution. Okay. So, d s will be equal to sigma y is constant and d y all right no problem there okay. therefore <coughs> my d y it will be equal to root 2 times sigma y times d s. Okay. Okay. Suppose I call the whole thing as for simplicity this as to save some time because we do not want to. <coughs> so, what you can say here the c equals to k a constant which is equal to this term minus infinity limits will not change as you can see minus infinity to infinity e to the power exponential what else did we get root 2 please see it <coughs> is there any mistake ok no mistake ok. So, this will be equal to k these are all constants. So, that comes out exponential square negative integration from minus infinity to infinity is equal to phi under root phi. So, what I am trying to say here is e to the power minus s square ok. So, have you done the things all right? Okay, looks okay. So let's now write the 
the value of k, k is your q phi sigma y sigma z u okay. exponential we will write that a little later. So, I can write here and then at square. So, this correct me if I make some mistake is that what can I write here 2 q 2 pi that is correct sigma z u exponential minus h square by 2 sigma z square. You get something like this? Okay. Why we are writing in this form is that that is how people sometimes prefer because this is a Gaussian kind of thing square root of root 2 pi and things like that. Otherwise, you can write in the form whatever way you like to write, but many of the books if you will see they have not derived this thing, but they will simply give you the understanding like this. So, this is your C. Make a note Q is in what? Mass per unit time per unit length. Okay. Where has sigma y disappeared? Obviously, sigma y is cancelled. Okay. What it means to you when you do not have any sigma y? It got integrated out. wind is blowing like this okay. and your y term is also disappeared okay. and this is one thing what we have assumed we have integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, we have taken this line to be infinitely long right infinitely long. So, what happens in this case is that see here with when I change the y okay. I change the y okay. and your emission is the same all throughout is your concentration any more function of y it is not function of y. So, that is why your y has completely disappeared from here. See if I take anywhere in the y I take the as long as my x is the same I measure the concentration at any place or model measurement of course, a little tricky, but that will be the same. So, that is why that got integrated out. Okay. The situation is the <coughs> little variation that we need to give here is suppose the wind direction is like this making some angle phi with respect to the road. Okay. In that case simply what you do c equals to 2 q root 2 pi sigma z u exponential minus h square by 2 sigma z square take the component in the take the component in the x direction of that thing. So, you simply do the sin phi obviously, if the sin phi is 0 concentration will be and cos sin phi is, not, is uh, the phi is uh, the sin phi is 0 then it becomes 0. Okay. What is sin phi is 90 then it is 1, okay. but we <coughs> we apply this particular this thing only for phi equals to like uh, more than like 20, 20 30 degrees or more okay. because then otherwise you know uh, you will get the concentration is 0 okay. and so this is how we can get to work through the the line source. So, little variation I could have still maintain z here there was no problem right I put z equal to 0. 
if I want to maintain the z, I can still keep the z as intact and z is not function of y. So, that still I can I can get the expression containing the z there. Okay. So, suppose you can further simplify this one is suppose you think your 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 cars and scooters and trucks are emitting at effective height 0, this is morally groundless. So, you can put this equal to 0 this becomes 1. So, that very variation you can do, but why we are writing in terms of the edge sometimes many of the industries okay, we, we model them as a line source. One example I will give you because that you have the background is the is the aluminum plant. Okay, you have many pots okay, and this line may run into 700 meters, 800 meters and you know the, the top of the emissions are there in the uh, aluminum smelters. So, they all will be they will be opening on the top, okay, they will be so there will be emissions this is the plan, plan of aluminum pot line. Okay, it is very long. Okay. If you remember I had shown you the picture and that it looked very long. So, so in that thing the, this may be about 30 meters high from the ground. So, then you will maintain the edge here, but some sources which are more or less the ground level sources you can do this one. Okay. Sometimes people set the uh, the wall of their um, field on fire, okay. then you can apply these conditions. Okay. Sometimes people have also tried to model the drift of the snow. Okay, like because the wind then there is a snow drift some people have applied this kind of something not exactly same, but something similar, but then you treat this line as the infinitely long having the same emission at each point. So, now you can apply this model at the situation where it wants time and again I say this q is mass per unit time per meter because people people many people make the mistake and this is how you can do. So, in summary what we have done is we can model a point source we can model an area source, we can model a line source. Okay. Maybe the next class will do one example.